Good morning and welcome to Lexington Park Baptist Church. Would you please stand and join us as we start out the worship service with the same Jesus.
us. Welcome everybody here to Lexington Park Baptist Church where God is on the move. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. God is on the move. All right, I feel like we're parting the Red Sea here. So in the greeting time, if some of y'all want to fill in the middle, you, you, you can, okay? The, the lopsidedness on the sides, uh, to spread it out. But I want to welcome everybody here. Glad that you're here today with us. If you're our guest here today, there's a detachable portion of your program. You can fill that out between now and the end of the service. There's a black box in the foyer by the staircase please place that in there. That's your gift to us today, just letting us know you're with us today. If you're online, please sign in. Let us know your last name and how many is with you. Thank you for joining us on there. And you can also follow along on your Bible app and follow the order of worship and everything from your own home. So thank you for joining us from there too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your many promises. We thank you that, I mean, we just sang about you are the same Jesus. You are the same yesterday today and forever. Lord, you will never stop your promises. You'll never give up on your people. And we can come in here today, Lord, knowing and trusting you completely. Things may not always make sense. We may go through, through trials and tribulations. We may go through storms and fires, and we may be on the mountaintops. Lord, and we may be, find ourselves even in valleys. But God, you're with us. Lord, we ask you to be here with us today as we praise you, as we exalt the name of Jesus. May you be lifted high. And Lord, may you draw people near to you. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Listen to the word of the Lord. The testing of your faith produces endurance, James 1.3. Let's make sure no matter what we're going through that we know that God is making us, uh, producing greater faith in each and every one of us. In the life of our church today, if you can get your communicator out, I have a few announcements for you. Communicator is in your program. You can pull that out. And it's a one-page paper that gives you all the information that's going on currently in the next week or two or through the month. So first of all, I want to point, who likes Chipotle? 
You're more excited about Chipotle than church. Who likes Jesus? All right, okay, I'm just making sure Chipotle's good though, all right? So listen, Chipotle fundraiser is March 5th from four to eight. You need to let them know you're there for the Lexington Park Baptist Church preschool and a percentage of what you buy that night will go back to our preschool ministry that we run down uh, through, through the week and we have like 75 students this year. It's amazing and we're ministering to these young families. This helps offset our costs. So if you wanna go, you gotta eat Tuesday night. If you didn't plan anything, make it Chipotle. All right, I want you to look at the Easter events, just getting ahead of this so that you can see all of those things are on the screen, but they're also in your program. So we are gonna have Palm Sunday service here. We'll have the palm branches and everything. And then there's no regular activities the week of that week for Easter week. But on the 29th, we have a Good Friday service. If you've never been to a service of darkness, the room will be totally pitch dark. Different people will get up and read the different experiences that Jesus goes through with, through his death and his crucifixion. And then we end with the hope of Easter, that Jesus will rise three days later, and then we'll meet at sunup service at Cedar Cove Beach. More directions will come later. We may have some polar bear baptisms that day, so if you need to be baptized and you're courageous to be in 45 degree weather and you've never been baptized, bring it on, let's do it, right? So there's a couple of people, that, there's four people need baptized. Some of them are like, wait a minute, the, the jacuzzi back here, or 40 degree temperature waters. Uh, so anyway, hopefully we'll have some baptisms, but if we don't, no big deal, Palm Sunday's fine for that too. Uh, but if you, if you need to be baptized, we are offering that out there at the Sun Up service. And then Easter celebration will be here at 10 a.m. So please mark your calendars, be a part of that. Uh, one thing I wanna advertise that I need to promote now is March 11th is Walk for Life. The Walk for Life is held in Annapolis. Uh, so it is on a Monday and uh, there'll be thousands of people there. Um, uh, there is a Protestant service and a Catholic service that leads the way. I'm the pastor actually this year at the Protestant service. And, and so that starts at 5.30 and then we move to where we start to march and we march on Annapolis and then they have prayers and speaking there right in front of the governor's mansion. So if you're interested in being a part of that, uh, please join us. You can, you can, we're gonna carpool from here. You can follow those directions to meet in the parking lot or you can go on your own. If you're going, let me know so we can text and we can find each other in the crowd so that we can walk together as a church. So uh, I encourage you, sign up out there. Let me know you're gonna go. Um, and if you need to, and if you're gonna go with me on my time, let me know. If you're gonna come later, let me know on that form too out there at the two, either one of the desks, you can sign up out there. You can see there's a game night. You can see leadership conference. That's for the deacons, council, and church staff. So if you're part of that, make sure you mark your calendars for uh, March 23rd. And then uh, also we want to continue to say we need volunteers in different areas. So if you wanna sign up, the Blossom Festival is the next big community event that we do. It's held right over across the street at the other side of Lancaster Park. Um, they're actually going to be doing a ribbon cutting that day for uh, some new areas that they've expanded over there. Um, they've asked our church to be the host of that. So I'll be leading the prayer over that ribbon cutting with the commissioners. That'll be at one, but the event's all day. You can go there, they have Frisbee golf there, they have all kinds of booths and food there. You can go get a bunch of free swag and it also supports our community and we'll have a booth there. So we need people to do the booth where you pass out literature on our church. Again, you can sign up for that in the foyer. I think that's enough on the announcements right now. Just please mark these things on your calendar and listen, anybody and everybody can do that booth, amen? All right, even if you're an introvert, you can pass somebody a piece of paper and go, here, come to our church. Right, or you can do it like Sandy would. Hey, I'm so glad to meet you. How are you doing? Would you please come? Our church is right over those trees. I can do a tour right now for you if you'd like. So you can go in, yeah, yeah, see that? Yes, I'm pretty close, you would do that too. You don't know, yes. Now Dave, he would do the introverted conversion. Yeah, that's, that's yes, that's why you're a team. So I wanna encourage you to be a part of that though. It's important to get a positive message out with the gospel and about our church and support our community as we do that. So with that, let's stand and greet one another. Tell somebody you're glad to see them here today.
If I could have you return to your seats, please. Hey, just because Will and I met, hey, Will, good to see you this morning, brother. Amen. Love you, man. So if it's good to be in the house of the Lord, say amen. amen. So after service, please continue this fellowship, loving on each other. Good to see everybody here today. So uh, I want to go over our, our missionary moment of the, this week. The people you can pray for is no Nolson and Edna Cherry, and they are ministering in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for our convention. So they're missionaries for us to the city of brotherly love. They're asking us to pray for growth of mentoring relationships between young and older believers in the church that they've planted. What they've done is they, a lot of churches have revitalized churches. The church kind of dies and then they restart it. Some of the older people stick around, agreeable to how they're gonna grow and the younger families come in. And so um, sometimes there's struggle there. So churches that are doing that, please pray for them. A lot of times they'll send a missionary in to help those churches. So this is one of those areas where uh, Philadelphia is definitely gone secular and gone away from the Lord, and it's unchurched and in downtown, and they're trying to bring revitalization back to the gospel to downtown Philadelphia. So let's pray uh, for these two missionaries that are doing that right now. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you uh, for the Cherry family that's gone in here to plant an inner city Philadelphia and to revitalize churches and to grow older believers with new believers and new converts to reach the city of Philadelphia. Lord, we pray that you use them in a powerful way and specifically they've asked, may the Lord blow our minds with what he's gonna do. God, may you blow their minds away with the power of the gospel to reach this community of Philadelphia that needs Jesus. And Lord, I pray that there'll be an encouragement to each of us that we'll remind ourselves we need to reach the people of Lexington Park. So we pray for our missionaries around the world. We pray for us to be missionaries in our community and we pray that the gospel will flourish as a result. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Dave's gonna read our scripture of the day for us. Okay, uh, good morning. Today's good morning. reading is from Colossians 4, verses seven through 18. Tachikis, our dearly beloved brother, faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all about the news about me. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know how we are and so that uh, and so that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, a faithful and dearly loved brother who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, as does Mark, Barnabas' cousin, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And so does Jesus, also called Justice. These alone of the circumcised are my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, Jesus, sends you greetings. He is always wrestling for you in his prayers so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything God wills. For I testify about him that he works hard for you, for these in Laodicea and for those in Heropolis. Luke, the dearly loved physician, and Demas send you greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her home. After this letter has been read to, at your gathering, have it read also in the church of, La of the Laodiceans and see that you also read a letter from Laodicea and tell Archippus, pay attention to the ministry you have received in the Lord so that you can accomplish it. I, Paul, am writing this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains and grace be with you. All right, would you please stand and join us as we continue worship with Good God Almighty. I can't count the times I've called your name some broken night. You showed up and patched me up like you do every time I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. There ain't no way you'll ever let me down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praise your name no matter what comes. Cause you know where I 
without your mercy So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs Is he good? He is good Is he God? He is God
is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and is living will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. He does. Does our God 
not intend to dwell again with us. He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, He has made us a kingdom of priests to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy? All blessing and honor and glory. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. Is he worthy? Father, we ask you just to inhabit the praise of your people right now. Be here as you've heard us exalt Christ. So we've declared how worthy he is. Lord, we ask you just right now in our lives to, to acknowledge him as the one true living God, our Savior, our Lord, our brother, our master, and our king. May we bow our knee to him today and give you, Jesus, are all. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our time of giving now, just be mindful we have the black box in the foyer by the staircase. We also have two boxes up front in each corner at the end of service. If you would like to give, you can give there. You can also give online, and you can follow along those instructions at lpbconline.org. Thank you for your generosity. Sandy Holtzman is going to be leading us to our offertory prayer and scripture. Our scripture this morning is 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and save in keeping with how he is prospering, so that no collections will need to be made when I come. Please pray with me. Father God, I do give you thanks so much for the abundant blessings that you just shower upon us. Yes. Help us, Lord, as we um, make decisions about what we do with those gifts, whether it's um, our time, our talents, our money, that you would help us to be generous um, as we return back a portion of what you have given to us. I pray that you bless the offering that's collected today, the tithes and offerings, and that you would just multiply it and that you would use it for your glory and for your kingdom and help us to be cheerful and generous givers in all the things that we do for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. These past two weeks, the, anybody who gets assigned to sing a special gets sick. So uh, I guess don't sign up to sing a special, and yeah, you don't get sick, amen? So anyway, it gives me a little bit more time to preach today, so that, that's a good thing. Um, let's raise our Bibles high. Say this with me. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path, and hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen, and God bless you. Uh, just take a time on, on the Bible. If you do not have the YouVersion Bible app, make sure you pick, pick up a communicator or, or go online and look at that. The, we want to encourage you to use the Bible app. If you go to the events page, the worship service is in there every single week if you didn't know that. Also, you can follow along. All the scriptures are right there. You just follow through. Anything that we read is right there on the YouVersion Bible app. Um, again, uh, just kind of emphasizing that for you. Also, Right Now Media will be launching that next week. So if you don't know what Right Now Media is, go to our website, lpbconline.org. You can click on Right Now Media, sign up. We'll give you access code. You can share that with friends and family. There is no limit to the amount of people who can have access to that information. So we want to encourage you as we really are studying God's Word, those two tools, the YouVersion Bible app 
and also uh, the Right Now Media are there for you to use to, to grow in Christ and also to grow in small groups as well as individually. So I want to encourage you to do those things. All right, with that, today we're picking back up with this sermon series we've kind of been in, in marriage, divorce, remarriage. And today, I, I'm going to, if you're new here, I'm going to preach different than I normally do. I normally am not scripted, and I normally walk around, and I'm usually a life application pastor. Um, there's going to be life application, but this is more educational today. So I have to stay in my script because it's very scholarly. So I hope it's not boring, but it's going to be very scholarly. It's very deep. I'm going to use words you maybe never have heard before, like the Mishnah and other things that in seminary we study. All right, so the Talmud we study. These type of things that I will share with you today will help you understand how a Jewish person would have thought in Moses' day, how a Jewish person would have thought in Jesus' day, and then how we should apply those things to us today. So as I go through this, uh, again, please forgive me, but please follow along. I think the content is excellent and superb, so I, I pray that as you do follow along, uh, you'll get something out of this. So I want to thank everyone who's written me and called me about the sermon series we're in. What I keep hearing from people is that I've never, one, I've never heard this before preached ever. People avoid it. Two, I've never heard it to where it's been positive. It's always been, you're divorced, you're a second-class citizen. Okay? Um, and I'm hearing people that are very encouraged because they've learned things that they never had known that they assumed, they assumed because they'd always been taught something, and now they realize maybe what they had been taught was wrong. Just let that sit for a minute. That's humbling, is it not? That's humbling. So I want to thank those people that are writing me, and I want to thank God that is encouraging you. So I want you to know that I think it's important that we understand how God's people would have thought about marriage, divorce, and remarriage in Moses' day so that we can understand the conversation next week that we have with Jesus in Matthew 19. Understanding Mosaic Law and the Mishnah, I'll explain what that is in a minute. Understanding the Messiah and the early church, how they responded to marriage, divorce and remarriage is important for us to understand in the 21st century. Understanding these things will reveal to us the heart of God. The Mishnah reveals Jewish thought. You can look that up. It's spelled M-I-S-H-N-A-H. M-I-S-H-N-A-H. I don't expect you to read it, all right? You, you probably would fall asleep, all right? But to be honest, it is how they would have understood what Moses was teaching. It's how they would have applied the law in the Jewish courts. It's how they would have understood what Moses really meant and how they applied it to their lives. Without the Mishnah, you can read something and, fu and fully not understand how a Jew would think about it. And so one thing I learned in seminary was this. A scripture can never say something it never said to the first audience. Think about that. We come and reread the scripture and we read it from the 21st century. They would have understood it from their perspective. If you are going to properly understand scripture, you must, listen to what I'm saying, you must understand it from the audience that first heard it. If we don't, we do a thing called eisegesis, which means we make presuppositions of what we think it means. So understanding these things is important. Understanding the Shammai and Hillel way of thinking. I know those are big words you've never heard before. I understand. But the Hillel and the Shammai are influencing how the Jews thought of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. One was very conservative, one was very legalistic, and the other was a little bit more liberal and more accommodating and actually became extremely liberal and could divorce a wife for any reason whatsoever. So we're dealing with both of these th ways of thinking that they would abuse Moses' law by the time Jesus gets here and he would say there's a hardening of the hearts. We'll talk about that next week. The hardening of the hearts is because they abuse the laws of God. So, I realize that marriage, divorce, and remarriage are important topics. Every single person in this room has been influenced by them. There's not a single person in this room that would not say they don't know somebody that's been through a divorce. Maybe you've been through one. Maybe as a kid, you experienced your parents going through it. Maybe you have good friends or relatives that went through it. Maybe you have coworkers that are going through it. 
Maybe you see people that struggle with remarriage. Can I even remarry? Because the church tells me I can't. Or if I do, I'm in sin. Or can I even serve in the church again because I went through a divorce 30 years ago? These things are real things that affect us every single day of our lives. You can't get around it. It's real. It's there. What do we do, church? I think in many times the church has just a strict position and they don't tolerate anything outside of that and that I don't think that's right. So I want us to get today to where we have a greater understanding over something that is real. By the way, I remarry people that have been divorced. I counsel people that are going through divorce. I counsel couples that are trying not to get divorced. And I do premarital counseling with people who are getting married. There's a combination of things that I do all the time that you'll never see behind the scenes that are important to every single one of our lives in this room. And I encourage you, as I go through this, I pray that you'll listen with an open heart. Those that have the ears to hear, let them hear what the Word of God will say today. The church has not always gotten this right. When I say church, I want you to understand this. I'm talking church at large, not necessarily Lexington Park Baptist Church. I'm talking churches I've served in the past, churches that I know in the, in the local community. The church has not always gotten this right. In many ways, we've gotten marriage, divorce, and marriage, remarriage, wrong. In some ways, we've gotten it drastically wrong. The church needs to acknowledge this and change its practices so that we have a greater understanding of God's word and God's heart. Most of us have grown up learning this. Divorce is bad. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Every, by the way, it's good that you learned that. Divorce is bad. Has anybody been taught divorce is good? Would anybody go around saying, divorce is good, go get divorced? No, no matter what the reason for divorce, it's painful. So remember this, divorce is bad. But we've also been taught this, God hates divorce. I taught you last week in Malachi 2.16, you've been wamboozled because it actually doesn't say that. Listen to what the Word of God says in the CSB, Malachi 2.16. If he hates and divorces his wife, who's he talking about? The man. If the man who's married hates his wife and divorces her, then guess what? The God of Israel says this. He covers his garment with injustice. That's when I used that duct cape last week. It's violent. It rips apart. It's unjust. And a man is abusing the laws of Moses to... to to divorce a woman, and God calls it treachery. It's treacherous to hate your wife. Gentlemen and wives, it's hatred, it's hatred, it's treacherous to hate your spouse. We're supposed to love them. Love God and love one another. We should love our spouses. So God is opposed to that behavior. So don't anybody think that this is justifying divorce. God does not like it, but we get this idea God hates divorce. It's stuck in our head from the King James. And then we can't remove ourselves from that. And therefore, that then plays out to this way. Then we treat people who've been divorced differently. Who in here can say and deny that does not happen in the church? It has. That is never God's intent. That is not God's heart. So we've grown up with this. And if we're not careful, we act treacherously than against others that have been through a hard time in life. That are trying to put their lives back together. And we treat them differently. It is true God doesn't like divorce, but he doesn't hate those who have been divorced. Do you understand that? We need to separate those two things. So God does not necessarily, he doesn't like divorce, but he doesn't hate the person that's been through divorce. God loves people. In fact, that word in Malachi for hatred means to hate a person. Does God hate anyone? You can, this is class participation. Does God hate anyone? That text cannot be from God then. But a man can hate another. We can hate people. And in our hearts, treat people differently, including our spouses. And that's the whole point of Malachi. So it is true that we need to deal with this. Too many of us have faced the scorn from within the church because of divorce, regardless of the reasons. As a result, some have carried guilt instead of receiving forgiveness. I want to go slow through this. I know some of you are carrying guilt instead of forgiveness. I know some have been judged instead of embraced. I know some of us want to know what to believe. I hope everyone wants to know that today. 
What am I supposed to believe? I think some of us know deep down the restrictive, almost legalistic teachings of some modern-day churches on divorce. They just don't seem right. Just sit in that for a minute. You may not have a biblical answer like I'm going to give you today, but you're just like, some just don't sit right with that. And then there's also this other extreme. There's liberal leanings where some churches have redefined marriage where it doesn't even look like marriage anymore. Come on, yes? Now, we're quick to bash them, aren't we? I am too. The apostate positions that are not God-honoring and they profane marriage and they degrade the covenant of marriage. Both extremes exist in our culture today. How do we find that sweet spot in the middle where we meet God? And today, I hope to help you do that. I assume that all of us want to honor God. There's an assumption I make with this group today. I assume you want to honor God. I assume you want to honor God in your marriage. I assume you want to honor God if you're going to find yourself in a bad place and you've gone through a terrible divorce and you want to come back to God and you want to try to make things right. And I want to assume this, that if you've been remarried, you're doing everything you can to honor God in the marriage you're in now. Those are assumptions that I make. I, I believe that everyone in here has that intent. I believe that we all take forsaking all things and all others seriously in this room. When we take a wedding and we do a wedding and we say, I'm going to forsake everything else and all others to be devoted to you, that we mean business when we do that. Amen? Every single person, I don't believe anyone walked the aisle, at least no one that I've ever married, saying, yeah, I don't want to do that unless it really conveniences me. No, we forsake all others. We believe that. We need to know that there are exceptions in unique cases, and I think we're bad at acknowledging that. Additionally, knowing that people make mistakes. We live in a broken world. We need to be careful not to treat divorce like a greater sin than any other sin. Really important that I say that. We need to make sure that we do not treat the sin of divorce, when it is sinful, any greater than any other sin. Is there anyone in this room that has never sinned? Raise your hand. Ke Kelly, be careful. You're waving your fan, man, right there. Yeah, yeah. That hand's getting close to going up. You know, I think Jesus has asked that question before. You who have no sin, cast the first stone. And what did they do? They all left. And this, this woman deserved death. She was caught in adultery. But Jesus forgave her. I think an example to all of us, we do not treat any sin different than another sin when someone repents and someone turns to Jesus. We should all embrace love, extend grace, mercy, and forgiveness for all who repent and come to our church. Amen? It's hard to change deeply rooted convention, convictions. I know this. What I'm going to say today, I know it's going to challenge. So I want to use the Mennonite faith, for example. Consider the Mennonite faith. Any, and if you come from the Mennonite faith, you may know this already. They did not allow instruments in worship for generations. So if you came in here today, they would consider us heretical because we have instruments playing. You can only sing a cappella. You can only sing. And listen, they have a good reason why they do this. Because the Old Testament has instruments, but do you know the New Testament never says or talks about instruments in worship? It never does until you get to heaven. So between the Old Testament and the New Testament, they decided we're not going to have any instruments. It's unbiblical to have instruments in the New Testament church. So they have forbidden instruments to be played in church worship services. Now, most of us probably think that's crazy. But I want you to see their logic. They're thinking the Bible does not teach that we have instruments, therefore we should not have instruments. So George uh, Brunk, Bishop George Brunk, and his son, George Brunk II, were key bishops in the Mennonite church, and they influenced this doctrine for generations. The Bronk descendants recently felt compelled to apologize to the entire Mennonite faith on behalf of their father and grandfather. Listen to what they wrote in an official capacity to the church. It is often later generations upon whom the responsibility falls to apologize for the sins of the fathers. Wow. Could you imagine grandchildren and children later on in the ministry acknowledging that their father or grandfather, who is held in such high regard, got it wrong? And they asked for forgiveness. They apologized to the entire denomination. Listen, the church has done this on other things. 
Southern Baptist, we got race wrong. Even to this day, racism, we get it wrong both ways. The church needs to do better, amen? How about this? I know people in this church that were forbidden to marry initially because they were interracial marriages. The church was wrong. The church was so wrong. Rows of women in society. The church was wrong. Well, that's a different issue. That's the liberal. I'm just dealing with, with good intent. But we were wrong. We should acknowledge these things. We should acknowledge that, hey, I agree, the sins of my forefathers, they got it wrong. Doesn't mean I hate on the forefathers. Doesn't mean they weren't good people. I don't agree with doing that, all right? But I agree with saying, look, they got it wrong. We need to get it right. And so this happens in every generation, I believe, where we need to make a decision on these type of things. On this issue of marriage, divorce and remarriage, I want everybody to listen to this part. I can't say with 100% accuracy that I have this right. But I can say with this, with 100% confidence, that I've done my best to understand this and present it to you today. I will also tell you this, I believe that good people can differ on this topic. I believe that sincere believers can have different opinions. Some will follow what they have ever always been taught their entire lives, and no matter what I say today, I won't change you. That's not my job. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's the job of the Word of God. It's the job of every believer here today to listen to what I'm going to present to you and to see and go check it with the Word of God and acknowledge that I see what Pastor Chris has taught and I agree with it. I may not fully agree with it, but I will tell you this, I'm rightly dividing God's Word. That is my job. And I want, if you know me well enough, I take that extremely seriously. My job today is to rightly divide God's word for you so that this church can be better in the future, so that we can learn from these things. And by the way, if you're new here today, because I'm preaching on this doesn't mean we have a lot of problems. It's bigger than this. It's about hearts. It's about us changing so we can reach, we can reach the people around us that are hurting. It's much deeper than one issue. So I want to give you a couple books before we read scripture. Two of my heroes, Wayne Grudem. Wayne Grudem is a good godly man, divorce and remarriage, in seminary 20 plus years ago. Yeah, I'm confessing that. All right, his theology book, which is about five times the size of this, was one of my primary study books that I had to study in seminary. But he wrote this little book on divorce and remarriage. I don't agree with him completely. I'm sharing a book that I don't completely agree with, but I think it shows a good example. He has changed over 20 years and his position has changed because he realized he misinterpreted some scriptures, and so now he allows for abandonment and abuse to be reasons for divorce that are biblical. So he, has cha- he confesses his sin in here. He confesses his wrong thinking in here, and he confesses that he misinterpreted scriptures based on how he had been taught his whole life. So you can read Wayne Grudem. Um, he still has some strong positions. All right, This other guy, this is brilliant. David Instone Brewer, Divorce, Remarriage in the Church, Biblical Solutions for Pastoral Realities. I got this, I think back in seminary, and I read it, and it was like, this has been the best book on this topic I've ever purchased. I've, I've got notes written in here, and I have to put dates now because it's all different colors. I have pink in here, I have black in here, I have blue in here. I try to use a different color every time I read it so that it's a different time period so I can see my way of thinking and how I've changed over the years. This book has radically changed my views on this thing, and it's totally based on scripture and Jewish thought. This is where I was first introduced to the Mishnah, and I want to encourage you to be introduced to the Mishnah too. So anyway, I'm going to leave these books up here. If anyone would like to come look at them after service, you can. I have more books than that, but those are the two I wanted to highlight. So anyway, if we're honest, I just want you to think of this. This is a very complex, very complex topic that applies to all of us. It's nearly impossible to do an exhaustive study. It's impossible. In fact, the more I start digging in, the more opinions you get. People are all over the place on this. I mean, good scholars. I love John Piper. Can't stand his position on it. Love John Piper, though. He will not even remarry someone that's been divorced for no reason. All right, that's his position, though. I respect the man. And then you have other people that 
have almost no standard at all. So we need to find that sweet spot where love and grace and forgiveness come to all who repent and turn to God. The scriptures provide us with guidance. It's not always easy to understand or apply. God didn't give us this neat little package and say, Bloop, here's all the answers. Sometimes it's spread throughout the entire Bible. That's why, we, that's why it's important to have systematic theology. We systematically look at the scriptures to form our theological positions. It's important that we realize that marriage is a covenant with God not to be broken by man. I want to say that again so nobody accuses me of heresy. Marriage is a covenant with God that is not to be broken by man. God is the one that sets the standards when it can be broken. We should always focus on the principle of the covenant. We should always turn people to try to work out their covenant. We should always try to make people understand you need to work your marriage out. And if anybody's in here and you've been married long enough, it is work. But we also need to know that there are permissible reasons and exceptions and unique cases that are specifically in the scriptures. Now, we should not start with them to form our theology. Everybody follow this. We don't start with what's permissible, what's the exception, or what the unique cases are. We start with the principle, which is marriage is intended to be permanent. Amen. That is what we all strive for. That is what we all pray for. That is what we all do when we say, I do. We must allow, though, to have and know these exceptions and realize that Jesus himself actually gave some exceptions. We need to focus on the covenant and then other things. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 19, 6. So they are no longer two flesh but one. Therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. I want to, this is important. What God has joined together, let no one separate. No man. Who sets the standards for separation? God. We read that, though, and this is what we say. We say this at weddings all the time. Till death do us part. You may have had that in your script. You may have had that in your marriage vows. Do you know what doesn't say that? I just read it for you. It doesn't say till death do you part. What it says, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Let no man separate. Only God has the right to do that. General rule one. Marriage is good. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is permanent. Marriage is about faithfulness. It's two flesh becoming one. And everybody should say amen. And that's the marriage morality that we should all have. That marriage morality is good. We should teach that to our kids. We need to teach that to each other. We need to encourage one another in fulfilling those things. General rule two, God has established reasons for marriage covenant, and he's also established reasons for separation. Exceptions, permissions, and unique cases. Over the next three weeks, we will study those things and discover those things together. Deuteronomy 24, one through four. Get your Bibles out. This is where we start. This is where we're gonna dig into the word. We're going to look at Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy 24. Both are going to be dealing with marriage, remarriage, and divorce. They're all going to form the back background in which Jesus' conversation next week in Matthew 19 will come from. You have to understand this to understand what Jesus is doing in Matthew 19. If you do not understand De Deuteronomy 24 and Exodus 21 even, you have the wrong backdrop for the question that Jesus was asked. And you have, you'll walk away with a totally different perspective of why Jesus said what he said. Let's read 24, 1 through 4. If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent, underlying indecent, indecent about her, he may write her a divorce certificate, underlying divorce certificate. He can hand it to her and send her away from his house. If after leaving his house, she goes and becomes another man's wife, remarriage is authorized. The second man hates her, then writes her divorce certificate, hands it to her, sends her away from his house, or he dies. The first husband who sent her away may not remarry her again. This will be extremely important in a minute as I explain why. Because she has been defiled because that would be detestable to the Lord. You must not bring guilt on the land of the Lord God is giving you as an inheritance. May God add a blessing to his holy word. This is the Mosaic law on divorce. This is it. The Mishnah explains it in great detail. We have the Hillel and the Shammai thought, but this is it. 
But in there you will see that divorce was authorized. Obviously marriage was, and remarriage was too. The only exception was you could not remarry the man you had just been divorced with your first husband. By the way, it also is treating women as a piece of property. Kind of. I'll get into that because Moses was a, a way ahead of his day. We are used to divorce in our culture. Are we not? Everybody say yes. I'm going to get in statistics next week. We cannot come up with our presuppositions to justify divorce. We cannot. It must be biblical. We must come to a, a biblical understanding of what would justify a divorce. We need to understand the origins of the divorce decree. They're right here from Moses. In the days of Moses, and written in the Mishma, they focus on one thing, indecency. What does this indecency mean? All right, both groups have thought of Hillel and Shammai would think it was sexual immorality. And Jesus would play on those words in Matthew 19 next week. You will find that. So except for sexual immorality. But the Hillel thought would take it greater. And the Mishnah actually says this. If you cooked your meal wrong, your man could divorce you. This was a way of thinking. This is what Jesus will deal with in Matthew 19. He's not dealing with the Shammai thought. He's not dealing with the fact that divorce is acceptable in certain circumstances. He's dealing with this view of thought that has said, if I want to marry her for any reason, I can. Women, how does that make you feel? Thank you, yes. Like a piece of property. We're going to get into that. Moses is actually protecting women here. But when you look at the mission of this indecency, and these are the two words you're going to hear come out, just cause and any cause. Just cause and any cause. When Jesus says cause in Matthew 19, he's referring to any cause. It's assumed. The audience would have understood this. This is really, really important. I understand not everybody can go to seminary. I know not everyone cares and does all the detailed study that I do. You can check me on this. Google Hillel and Shammai. Google just cause, any cause. You will find it's in the Mishnah. You will find that it was a Jewish way of thinking. It's still, it still is part of their teaching technique. Just cause and any cause. Jesus is defending just cause. Moses is defending just cause. So Moses is taking away, and so is Jesus, and so will Paul. He will take away that you can just divorce for whatever reason you want. And say, no, no, no. It must be justifiable by, by God. So indecency. And again, you can see how they could take that to mean anything. Well, it was indecent the way you dressed. It was indecent the way you spoke to me. It was indecent the way that you cooked your meal for me. And this is the extreme that would come out in Jesus' day. So this primary teaching of just cause and any cause divorce, the differences between these rabbinic teachings of the Hillel and Shammai are extremely important. Deuteronomy 24, look what's in there, you can underline it. Divorce was allowed for justifiable reasons. Remarriage was allowed. A certificate of divorce was to be extended by the hand of the man for a just cause, which they say is indecency. We need to understand that divorce and remarriage in Moses' day was about the treatment of women. It was actually protecting the woman. Women, I want you to see this. Moses, actually in his culture of the ancient world, was very liberal in his treatment of women. He was making sure that a woman would be free from the authority of a man and she would no longer be treated like a piece of property. I learned in my study that a man that practices of that day would divorce a woman for almost any reason. But I also want you to hear this. There's a reason it says you can't marry the woman that you first married. I bet no one's ever heard because this blew me away and it's real, it's there, it's in their way of thinking. That ancient day of culture would prostitute their wives off for a day. Not Jewish, but Moses was making sure that the ancient world would not influence, the people around them would not influence this. This is why Moses says, give a divorce decree, you can't go back and remarry your first one. So in other words, you can't prostitute your wife off and then remarry her. Wow, you can't treat her like a slave or a piece of property. I know, that's sickening in our minds, right? But the world back then did that. By the way, there are still some cultures that practice this. Blew me away too. Not of our faith, but of other faiths. There's also polygamy, all right? So 
Moses is trying to make sure that he defends the family and defends the woman, allowing for a divorce and allowing her to remarry and have a life. Moses was rejecting the practices of the ancient world. The Mishnah contains all the oral traditions and the practices of the Jewish faith. It'll have many of these things of just cause and any cause that I'm talking about. You can go read it there. You can Google it. You can look it up. I'm, 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 look it up. Go ahead and do that. You'll see that, man, Pastor Chris is right. This is how they thought. The Mishnah does say that. They did think that way. This is how they interpreted the law of Moses. If you want to understand how the law of Moses played out, you have to understand how the Jew would have thought. You have to understand how the rabbinical teachings had developed over the years to the days of Malachi that I preached on last week and then to the days of Jesus that will come 400 years later. They still are messing it up. And Jesus will confront them in Matthew 19. The Mishnah contains all the reasons that I've said for Deuteronomy chapter 24 and the background for Matthew 19 for next week. Defonzia is a Jewish uh, scholar. Listen to what he shares. This is what a Jew would have thought. Adultery, desertion, and cruelty are accepted for reasons for divorce as indecencies. Adultery, desertion, and cruelty. All are traditional reasons that were acceptable that the, that, that man had violated God's standard and that woman was free, was free from the marriage and could remarry and get a divorce decree. Also, he goes on to say domestic violence is specifically listed as well among these things. I bet you that's never been preached from this pulpit. And I bet, and unfortunately, very few churches or pastors will take this on like I am right now. I hope this is liberating for you. You may be offended. Again, my job is not to change you. I can't. Only the Holy Spirit can. Exodus 21, 8 through 11. This one's good. If that wasn't good, this one's good. All right? Exodus 21, 8 through 11. This is right after the Ten Commandments have been given and the law is all being developed. There is a, a talking here where Moses gets into this issue of divorce again, but from an enslaved woman. Listen to the word of God. If she is displeased, displeasing to her master, who chose her for himself, then he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has acted treacherously towards her. Why? Because he's hated her. Or if he chooses her for his son, he must deal with her according to the customary treatment of daughters. If he takes an and I know we don't think that way, I know that, that sounds gross. If he takes an additional wife, he must not reduce the food, clothing, or marital rights of his first wife. If he does not do these three things for her, she may leave free of charge without any payment. The free there is a freedom from bond. So this is about enslaved women. So I want you to understand the backdrop. There's a, there's a teaching technique that they teach you in seminary. It's, it's called a hierarchy of interpretation. If something is usually given to a lower level citizen in society or in that culture or that faith, those same principles would have applied to someone that's of hierarchy or higher in status. Would a Jewish woman be of higher status than an enslaved woman in, the first century, in, the, in their culture? Everybody say yes. So this higher, now I, there are some people, John Piper's one that disagrees with me. Uh, can I confess this? I mean, there are people that will say, you can't do that. But to me, this makes sense. If it's good enough for a slave woman, it would be good enough for a higher ranking person in society. And so look what he says here. This text is about enslaved women. Again, this hierarchy. If a slave could be treated with such dignity, would not a Hebrew woman be treated the same way? Would not a Hebrew woman be extended freedom from that marriage bond if her husband treated her this way? I believe the answer is yes. You can figure that out on your own. You can disagree with me. Again, I told you, good people can disagree. But I believe if it was good for an enslaved woman, it would be good for a Hebrew woman. I would say it's still good for a Christian woman. Dignity is something we need to establish with women. Some debate whether this was extended to the hierarchy, but at least with the slave woman, she was treated with dignity. A slave woman could be free from someone that treated her improperly. 
It could be we cannot just discard our wife. We cannot humiliate her. It's unthought of. So Jesus, or Moses is saying, you can't do this. You can't humiliate her. You can't make disgrace on her. You cannot discard her. If you do, she is free of you. And she's not a piece of property that you can now sell off. I want you to understand that's what they would have done. She's a slave. I can just trade her. I don't want her anymore. She's no good for me. So listen to what the three things, this way of thinking must apply to all of us. One, it says here, I love this word. This is not an Old Testament term. It says she can be redeemed. She can be set free. She can be redeemed. Let her be redeemed through another marriage where a man will treat her right. All right, so redeemed. Want to be redeemed. Also, we must have faithful treatment of a person. We must treat each other with dignity. Sometimes we treat our spouses with less than dignity, even in our culture today. We not, may not be able to sell women off and stuff like that, and we know that's all wrong, so don't take that like I meant that as a justification for that. We understand their culture, though, and then we need to look at it in the context of where we live. We need to be faithful. We need to treat the women in our lives respectfully, with great dignity, and we need to make sure that the redemption of Christ applies to all of us. And in marriage, we are partners and companions in a covenant. Amen? Three grounds, though, here in Exodus 21. If this woman was not provided, now I know we can, don't get into this, well, where's the line, Pastor Chris? I can hear it now. I don't know what it means by depriving her of clothing and food. I know she wasn't starving to death. But clearly there's a line where there's mistreatment and she was not being fed adequately or sufficiently and she was not being treated the same as the other women in that family. If that is such the case, in other words, a slave woman was not given the same clothing. Remember, polygamy did exist, right, in that day. Not justifiable by God, but if they had a wife and a slave wife, they must be treated equally. If this woman is not given the same food or clothing or marital rights, conjugal love, then she is free of that marriage. Look, I don't know how you can slice this or dice this. This clue is there. If a man neglects these things of his woman, she is free. How do we apply it to a modern day context? I'm not 100% sure. I told you I don't have all the answers. But I know this is the backdrop of Mosaic Law. So clearly in Mosaic Law then, we have adultery, we have abandonment, we have neglect, we have lack of conjugal love, and I would say abuse clearly fits in there. I agree with Grudem. Clearly, abuse or domestic violence would be part of the Mishnah and the way of thinking. Exodus 21 definitely builds upon this. Many scholars believe this also establishes grounds in which a man can abuse, cannot be allowed to abuse his wife. I believe that is good practice and a good principle. And I believe that those things have happened. Women, I do believe there is redemption for you. I will never look down upon you if you come to me and I know that's why you went through a divorce. Amen? And men, likewise, if you've been abandoned as well. Mosaic law allows for remarriage in Deuteronomy and Exodus, so should we. It was encouraged and it was assumed. Mosaic law protected the women and their families in that day. So what are our conclusions in these final moments? That's a lot of stuff. By the way, to get all the hours of study that I did, to get that as neatly as I could, that's the best I can do. I, thank you. Amen. I... I am willing to discuss this with you. If you want to have a panel discussion, if you need help, because like, I don't get it. I've never been taught that way. I'm going to refer you to the Mennonites. I'm going to ask you to change. But I'll engage this with you. We can talk, and again, I know good people can disagree. I'm looking at faces trying to figure things out. Some of you look very hardcore right now. Some of you have smiles on your face. So I don't know where you're at. But what I want you to know is that the background on this, we have not been taught this in our church. We have not, I don't think we've really, I think people avoid it and just say, divorce is wrong, boom. And then we don't really talk about it. We don't really deal with it. We don't really discuss what was, what was the thought of that day and what's Jesus think about this. Or then we just hear one little thing that Jesus says and we blow it out of context. That's eisegesis, I've been teaching you that. That's eisegesis. So, this may be the first time you've ever heard this. I get you. This might be big for you. 
I don't know that you can look at Deuteronomy 24 or Exodus 21 any differently than I have concluded with you. It's right there in black and white slapping you in the face. Now, we also need to understand the mission and how they applied it. And you can go read that on your own too. For many, it's the first time you've heard this biblical position and it will challenge deeply rooted traditions. Notice what I just said. Deeply rooted traditions and thoughts that you have been taught with good intent. I'm not bashing any pastor that's ever stood in this pulpit or any other denomination that has different conclusions. I'm not going to say, hey, Grudem is better than John Piper. Or, I'm not saying any of that. I love those men. They're good scholarly men. I need them in my life so that I can really look and study because I studied those men intensively for this sermon to form my conclusions. We must confess that we have drawn many conclusions based on limited understanding of the scriptures and Jewish thought. Sometimes we do that a lot, Christians. I could give examples. I won't because I don't have time to go into that. There's a lot of things we believe, and I'm like, I don't know that that really means that. You can go Google that, too, on stuff. Crazy things that Christians believe are actually in the Bible. Yeah, I mean, you can go Google that. There's some crazy stuff, and you're like, I believe that. Yeah, you, yeah, you shouldn't. There's some stuff out there that we do believe. We must confess that sometimes we do this. Most of us have been taught the morality of marriage. I am praising the morality of marriage. I am praising the oneness of marriage. I am praising the covenant of marriage. And that is what we all should strive to have in our lives. Amen. We should not be, let's run and get divorced. No. That's not what's being taught here at all. After you've done the work of not forsaking your spouse, after you've done the work of doing everything you can, and not any sooner. You should never even use the D word. And listen, husbands and wives, don't ever drop the D word in your arguments. Amen? Amen. I mean, that is, that is just wrong. Treacherous. Treacherous, thank you. Divorce does have consequences. We need to understand this. Even if it's for a just cause, the pain of divorce in this room, if you were a child, the pain of divorce of someone that's sitting here that tried and gave everything they could to their spouse and they still left you. The pain of someone coming home and finding your spouse giving marital rights to someone else. These things happen. Or abuse. I preached and Kathy would not mind me telling this. We, give her book, we gave her book out a couple months ago. She was abused for years you know, for, and, and was trapped. That's wrong. And God knows that. So we need to realize that sometimes divorce is sinful. Sometimes divorce is justifiable, but it's always painful. Amen? No matter what, it's always painful. It hurts me when I know that you've gone through that hurt. We need to strive to have a proper view of marriage, divorce, and remarriage in a broken world because it impacts each and every one of us. I gave you my testimony. I believe I can speak to this because I've never gone through that. Every, from my great-grandparents, grandparents, parents, Shawnetta's parents, I don't know divorce. But I have great compassion towards those of you that have gone through it. I have great compassion with understanding that just like in Moses' day, I believe Jesus would teach the same thing and Paul did too. You can remarry in the Lord. In the Lord. Really important. In the Lord. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. Most in the church, I think, don't understand and have a proper view of this. Not by your own fault. I hope today this will help you begin to do that. I have done my best to rightly divide the word of God on a complex and sensitive topic that our church can live in the freedom of Christ, that we can grow in his love, his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness in the broken world in which we live. I hope this sermon series will change hearts and minds, not just on this topic, but in how we approach any topic. I will give you an example. I was walking around yesterday I'm not going to say where. And I saw some furry people. Who knows who that is? 
I don't, if you don't know, don't worry, do not, go, do not Google it. Let's just say they leave a, a very unique lifestyle that's not compatible with Christianity. They think they're animals. And they live their life that way. And it gets even grosser than that, so I will spare you. But let's say one of those people came into our church. I know they would get looks. First of all, they would get looks from me too. I know, yes. That would be like, whoa, 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 okay. So if they came in here. But let's say somebody came in here and 10 years ago they were in college and they got caught up in that movement. And they did things that they're ashamed of. And now they're in our church and maybe they have gotten married and they're being productive in society and they've put the furry stuff behind and they're now living a productive life and they found Christ. That's what I see as a person that found Christ. I won't see the furry, the transsexual, the homosexual, the drug addict, you keep the prisoner, you name it. We see the person that's been redeemed. Divorce should be on that list of things too. When we look at a person where they're at. I hope that this will illuminate the mystery of oneness and the covenant of marriage and its importance. I speak from that, from knowing it and seeing that my entire life. And I am grateful for it. But I know not everyone in this room has the same story I do. And you are no different than me. I am not better than you. And I will never look at you that way. Amen. This starts by knowing that God loves all of us. God created us. He gave us this marriage covenant. But he also gave us this covenant with Christ. The covenant of Christ is redemptive. The covenant of Christ is shed by the blood of Christ to cover your sins so that all of us are forgiven and at the cross, the blood is the same for all of us. It's an eternal covenant with Jesus. It's built on love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. And thank God Jesus fulfilled the law for our behalf, amen? We will commit ourselves, I hope, to God's covenant today. We'll commit ourselves, yes, to the marriage covenant in the room, but also to the covenant that we have in Christ. I preached a few weeks ago, you're married to Jesus. He is faithful to you and me, even though we're unfaithful. The marriage to the bride, we're his bride. We're, we're his bride. May we be faithful to the Lord. May we be a church that's faithful to him and to our marriages. Now, you may need prayer today. You need to, may need to pray over your marriage. You may be married, but you're having a hard time. By the way, it's nobody's business. But you can come pray up here before God. It's his business. You may need to trust God with a painful divorce that's in your past. And it still haunts you to this day. I pray you'll find freedom. I pray that you'll ask God for healing and forgiveness. I find sometimes somebody that's been divorced is the most gracious, forgiving people that I know. Because they've dealt with the pain of unforgiveness. You may need to trust God in remarriage by being faithful to the marriage and God's purposes that you find yourself in now. You may need to ask God to help you remain faithful and reconcile your current marriage because you're struggling with not forsaking all others. Stay loyal to him. You're in it to win it, and God will help you. You may need to seek Christ as you enter into a decision to remarry, a just cause, perhaps, of your divorce, and you're remarrying, you find yourself in that place. I pray God will give you peace in that. These things should not be taken lightly. I'm not here to justify or judge. I want you to hear that. I'm not here to justify or judge you over any of this. But I am here to preach God's word. And I believe that I've done that today. That is between you and God. But I am here to bring understanding and reveal the heart of God to show us a way forward. Our need for love, grace, mercy, and to be faithful to God are endless. Today, may we commit ourselves to the faithful God and meet him here at the altar. Let's pray. Father God, I love you and thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for taking me back to my roots of seminary this last week or two as I've been delving into studying this. And God, I pray today that this topic 
as complex and as sensitive as it is, will be well received. I pray that maybe some of us need, can make those adjustments that we need to make. I pray that we'll embrace everyone in this room with grace and love and mercy and compassion. And that forgiveness will be extended equally to everyone. And I pray in this moment, God, that as people come to this altar to enter into a covenant with you for salvation or to enter into whatever covenant of marriage that they have right now or the brokenness that they find themselves in, that God, you'll meet them here today because you are a God of the covenant and you are always faithful. God, may you speak to us clearly. May your spirit move among us. May you draw people near. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. You come as the Lord leads. closed, camera on me. If today you need prayers for your marriage, would you raise your hand? Amen. 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 If today you need to let the pain of how you have felt treated differently by the church because of something you've gone through. Would you raise your hand to release that to God right now? Amen. Let those hands, yes. I see the hands going up. Thank you. Now this is the hard one. If you know this has challenged your core convictions of what you thought you knew on this and you need to let God work in your life, would you raise your hand so that I can see you? assume then everybody got it. Father God, may you move in our hearts today in the covenant that we have with you, built in trust in you alone. And I pray that you will make the bonds of the covenant in this room with each other as a church even stronger carry our crosses with each other and as we bear with one another and as we love one another, as we forgive one another and as we hold each other in this covenant that you've given us under the blood of Jesus where we are forgiven have received your grace and your mercy and your love. Lord, I pray the same for our marriages. Lord, may your, may your blood, may the blood of Christ just redeem our marriages. May you hold us in a covenant that we'll forsake all others, that we will be devout and we will love one another as we all see a marriage bond will work when we love each other. Lord, teach us to love one another. 
Teach us to love you and teach us to love our spouses. Teach us to love one another as we trust and obey you, as we live in a covenant with you. We pray this in Jesus' name for all of us. And all God's people said, amen. Sing one more verse. If no one comes, we'll close. encourage you, go look up what I preached. Go do it. How many pastors tell you to do that? I want you to go fact check me. I want you to go look at it. I want you to go look at the Mishnah. I want you to go look at John Piper who disagrees with me. And I want you to look at Wayne Grudem. And I want you to look at Brewer. And I want you to look at these different perspectives. And I hope then that you'll come to that sweet spot that God will bring us together and move us forward on these topics of marriage, remarriage, and divorce. So with that, we have normal services today. So whatever's going on with the handbell, youth group, and gap, I hope to see you here tonight. And for the rest of you, I hope you have a great week. Let's end in a blessing. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in Jesus' name, amen.